This is hell. The waters keep rising and the floods keep flowing over and devastating levees and farms throughout the American heartland. Here to give us his up-close and eyewitness account of what's happening, why and what, if anything, can be done about it when flooding is taking place, where the locals are so steeped in climate change denial. Returning to This Is Hell, writer Ted Genoways posted the New Republic article, River of No Return, How Austerity and Climate Change Put Northeastern Nebraska Underwater. Welcome back to This Is Hell, Ted. Thanks so much for having me, Chuck. It's good to be here. It's always great to have you on the show. So uh, the first time when I found out that you had an article at the New Republic, the first thing I said to Alex was, Ted Genoways is writing for the New Republic. And then he said, Chris Lehman is new, the new editor there. What's changed at the New Republic? Well, there's there have been some some shakeups, but uh, I think that the New Republic will still be uh, recognizable to its readers, and and they've been nice enough to to ask me to keep writing for them, and and so uh, you know that's I I, I think it's going to be the same great magazine that it has been, and that's that's certainly my hope. You write about Willard Ruzica, I believe is his name. Is that the correct pronunciation? Ruzichka, but yes. Okay, Ruzichka. I wasn't too sure if he was actually using that very uh, Czech pronunciation. Ruzichka uh, saw it all in a dream. The Niobrara River, which runs a few hundred feet from his family's farmhouse in the unincorporated village of Pishville, Nebraska, had topped its banks, but instead of water edging toward his house from the north, the Dream River, somewhere upstream in the direction of Spencer Dam, had jumped the channel and cut a new course from the south. Water came rushing down the road, uh, stranding the house as the river closed in from all sides. I woke up and was shaking, he remembers now. It was after 2 a.m. midwinter, the braided river through the trees, still thickly iced and unmoving. Was that kind of event something he and everyone in this area all Always feared, or was it an unlikely thing to happen? So an unlikely thing to dream. Because I'm trying to figure out if this is a fear that is a common occurrence for everyone, and so it's a very predictable dream to have, or was this an extraordinary, out of the ordinary thing to dream? So Willard is a a kind of um, perfect interpreter of the of the landscape there, because he is not only in his 70s, but has lived his whole life on this this one spot. Um, that is basically where the the Niobrara River and the and Verdigree Creek, which is um, a large north running creek, converge. And so um, Willard understands um, how that landscape has has changed over time. And and one of the things that that he told me that I thought was kind of key was that when he was a kid, he remembered that that the bank of the of the river was about Twelve feet from the surface down to the to the where the water was running. Today, it's about a foot to two feet um, below that surface, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that that Spencer Dam that's been sitting there um, for all of those years and and a little more um, has been silting in that part of the river, and so what we're seeing is a is a kind of convergence of not only the pressures that, that climate change and more extreme weather is bringing, but also what happens when you neglect the infrastructure. When you build a dam and say, you know, we'll let this sit here and, and do what, it, what it's doing, uh, controlling the, the water flow and, and producing a little bit of power, um, but we're not going to do the maintenance to it that um, is really necessary to, to protect the habitat and to protect the people who live downstream. And, um, I mean, we're reaching a point where there's going to be uh, something of a crisis on, on that front because the, the current infrastructure is old and crumbling, and even if it were uh, updated and, and we're running it at proper capacity, it's probably insufficient for, for what's ahead. And so... The, the interesting moment that we've entered here is a, is a point where everyone agrees the infrastructure has to be updated. Um, but now there's going to be a conversation about, well, what is, what's required? And this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. You're either going to have to decide, um, we don't think climate change is real, um, even when it's directly affecting us, and we're just going to rebuild the infrastructure, um, 
or we're going to recognize that there is a changing climate and, and changing weather, and that means that we need to build new kinds of infrastructure. And um, those conversations are going on now, and I, th I think it's going to be a fascinating moment to see how people who are directly affected, um, who have been far from these policy debates and have mostly kind of put these things out of mind, um, how they're going to confront these issues and, and what they're going to do when they have to decide locally, um, do we believe in this and do we trust the science? You know, Ted, I've got 50 questions written down here for you, and then you say something during the response, and it leads me to a follow-up question. So then we make some of these other questions. So uh, you said new kinds of infrastructure. What happens if they replace the old infrastructure with the same old infrastructure? What happens if they go about putting in the new, uh, putting in, uh, replacing the infrastructure with the same old strategies that they'd used in the past? Well, one of the things that, that you see along um, the, the, the rivers, the Niobrara, the Platte River, the Missouri River, um, is the use of, of old um, earthen dams and, and levees. And, uh, you know, very often the, the, those dams were kind of reinforced by, by planting trees on top of them to hold the, the, the soil in place. That works great as long as the the river is never running higher than that point, and it's also um, it works fine as long as there's not ice running on top of the river. And what happened this time was that not only that the that the water was running much higher than it usually does, but it was carrying huge ice flows. And when those ice flows hit a tree at sort of mid level, it tears the trees out and takes the dam with it rather rapidly. And so you not only get the, the danger that's associated with, or, or the, the, the damage that's associated with the flooding, but you get an, an element of danger where the dam is holding um, and people have this sort of false impression that the dam is safe right up until the dam goes. And so this is, this is a case where it's it's really going to be necessary um, to do some of the simple things like have the Army Corps of Engineers come in um, and be involved in, in the planning, designing, and building of these dams and to overbuild them for what seems necessary right now um, as we recognize that, that these occasional um, – surges in the river are, are getting higher and, and are the product of more extreme rainstorms coming through and snowstorms coming through. That's uh, the problem, of course, is that's more expensive. If, you, if you're involving um, outside engineers, if you're um, building to higher specifications than, than you have in the past, you're talking about committing more resources. And right now, um, that means that you're that you're committing more resources and uh, in stating local taxes to pay for that, because very often the federal dollars just aren't there. So, you write that the Spencer Dam was 92 years old, and state inspectors in April 2018 had classified the risk stemming from its disrepair as significant. That would seem then that the Spencer Dam collapse was inevitable. What explains? the lack of response by the local community to address the Spencer Dam when the inspectors had said that the disrepair was significant? Well, I mean, that, that, so that same report said that the, that the dam should hold as long as we, we didn't have um, what they called a rare extreme storm event. Um, the problem is that these extreme storm events are becoming less and less rare. Um, and and a, a fair amount of what I think is is a kind of useful way of, of thinking about and talking about what's going on here is that for insurance purposes and for uh, federal purposes, there's there's the the floodplain, there's the hundred year floodplain, and there's the five hundred year floodplain. And the idea is that that hundred year and five hundred year uh, floodplains are for 
the extremely rare uh, weather events, the, the, the cases where this is, this is you know, probably never going to happen in your lifetime. It's, we've only got indications that it reaches this level, um, you know, two times in a thousand years. The problem is that in some of these places in, in Nebraska and other uh, middle states along these rivers, there are towns that have seen 500-year floods three and four times in the last 20 years. That's obviously not a 500-year flood anymore. We have to start talking about these things in different terms, and we have to start planning for them. You can't you can't simply rebuild after a 500-year flood anymore without looking back and assessing um, what what was the interval since the last time we had that. And if it's if it's getting to be the point where um, these are these are frequent events and not rare events, you have to plan accordingly. How much are the problems that the American Great Plains, the heartland, whatever you want to call it, how much are the problems of flooding that they're now facing? How much is that due to human interference with nature? That is not when it comes to climate change, but human mismanagement, possibly, of nature. What role does human man- human management play in this flooding disaster? Well, I think it's it's significant because, you know, what is... What's happened is that, um, especially in the, the middle of the country, um, along the, the river valleys, we, we built our towns and cities in places that were accessible by river, um, settled at, at, by, by white settlers coming west at a point when that was the best way to, to get goods for your town and to send what you were producing um, back east, often settled, uh, you know, before even the, the the arrival of the railroads, and so that is where the population centers are, and um, and so it's difficult when people say, well, you know, there's a there's a town like a town like Hamburg, Iowa, that has flooded several times in recent years, and really done total destruction to the town. You hear people say, well, why do you keep building there? Um, it's, I mean, it's a reasonable question, but I guess the question that I would have is, are we still going to be framing the question in that way if we're talking about St. Louis or if we're talking about Kansas City? Um, you know, we have large urban centers that, that are built along these places. And so what we've, what we've done in order to protect those sorts of settlements is exactly what you said. We've interfered with those those places in various ways. We've we've built dams, we've built levees to try to control the flow, to direct the flow, and um, you know it it has been successful and and f- for the time that it has been there. I mean, you think about a dam like Spencer Dam being close to a hundred years old. Um, that. That covers a lot of the history of of Nebraska. I mean, Nebraska only became a state 150 years ago. So that infrastructure was incredibly effective um, for the period that it was that it was built in. But it's now time. I mean, it's it's really way past time to to update and and maintain uh, this infrastructure. One of the things that struck me doing the research on this, there were um, as of the time that I was writing, there were about a dozen levees on the Missouri River um, that had failed as as a result of the flooding. Of those 12 levees, at least seven um, had been classified as minimally acceptable uh, for safety when they were inspected more than a decade ago. They had not been inspected since. So it's it's not as though uh, we didn't know there was a problem. There were three others of the dams that hadn't been inspected at all. So, if you're not if you're not paying attention to the state of the infrastructure, if you're looking at the state of the infrastructure and seeing that it's that it's crumbling and needs repair, and you decide to just push it off, eventually what you're going to end up with is disasters, and that's kind of where we are now. So it would seem <clears throat> the people of these small towns, or at least their political le- leadership, chose not to address the inevitable collapse of their infrastructure. Uh, 
could they avoid avoid uh, afford to do otherwise? Was it simply cost prohibitive for them to address the problem, or is this more of a political decision? I think it's a combination of the two. I think that that um, the the cost was significant, and obviously it increases over time. The more you let uh, infrastructure stand and um, and become outdated and and insufficient the more costly it's going to be to replace it. Uh, but then you start getting into the political debates, of course, when you when you say, well, we need to raise taxes for a, a, a local bond to, to repair this. There are questions of, you know, why isn't the federal government paying more? Why are we not getting more from, uh, from the state? Why don't we get... And, and I think often in places like Nebraska, you get conversations about rural rural urban divide as well, um, where there are people who are in small communities saying, we're controlling the flow, not only for ourselves, but for larger urban centers like Omaha downstream. Why are our our taxes going up instead of taxes being increased um, in Omaha to help pay for these projects? The thing is that this is this is exactly where not only state but but federal um, issues and 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 involvement start to come in. When you're talking about rivers that that not only cross but actually define the border between states, you you need to have federal involvement. And and right now everything is is comp- completely gridlocked and politicized. And I mean, the thing that I, I would never have guessed and, and still feel most shocked by in this whole um, particular instance is that, I mean, th- this flooding happened, the, the start of it happened in mid-March. The, the funding package um, approving the first federal aid for the people who were affected by this flood just passed this week. It's at a point where it takes three months just to get all of the, the everything aligned so that you can pass aid packages for people whose farms and homes have been devastated. And the thing that's especially shocking about that to me is that the, that the people affected were primarily in red states, but the, but the obstacles that were being put up were primarily being put up by the president by Republican senators, by Republican members of Congress. But, as you point out in your article, most Nebraskan politicians, most Nebraskans in general, are Republicans. So do you think that there is any possibility whatsoever that the Trump administration will be held to account for this lack of addressing the problems with the infrastructure in the heartland that has led to flooding and has devastated farmers? I don't know that the change will come from this alone, but I do think that one of the things that's happening, and um, it's starting to be measurable, is that that when you start combining the fact that crop prices are about half what they were just a few years ago, um, and so that income has already been cut, and then you have Trump coming in and saying, we're going to start a trade war with China, imposing tariffs um, on China, so that China turns around and says we're not going to get our soybeans from from the U.S. Where you have the market uncertainty of of Trump saying we're going to toss out NAFTA, we're going to um, you know threatening to impose high tariffs on Mexico, and then withdrawing that threat at the eleventh hour. Um, all of these things create tremendous market uncertainty. And, you know, we've just passed through the moment where farmers had to make their decision about what they were going to plant for the fall, for October. And a moment like what we just passed through, where everyone had planted corn because soybean prices are so low, but they were having trouble getting out to plant the corn because everything was so wet from the flooding. You finally get the corn in in the ground, and that's going to be. I mean, you're, you've gambled everything on that, and then Trump comes out and says, 
maybe I'm going to impose tariffs on Mexico. Mexico is is the country that imports more American corn than any other country in the world. The panic that went through the the farm community was understandable and palpable. They keep doing that over and over again. And I do think that when you get all of these things working together, where the conditions are are bad, where the the support is little, and then the the markets are are constantly being uh, shocked and and made unpredictable, that 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 does have an impact, and that there's there's a point at which I think people start to say, you know, this is this is not what we need. We need different leadership than this. You write about how, gener- quote, generations of neglect to key pieces of infrastructure have allowed dams, levees, and dikes across the Midwest and Great Plains to collapse of Nebraska's 137 levees monitored by FEMA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Fewer than half were constructed with federal oversight and support. Not one is currently maintained by the Corps. Why weren't they constructed with federal oversight and support and could have that federal oversight and support made it so these levees wouldn't have collapsed. I mean, I think there's 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 just no question that if if the uh the Army Corps of Engineers had been involved in in planning um and construction of th- some of these levees and dams that they would have been in better condition and that they would have held. Um and so that's the thing is that there's there's there really is a confluence here of circumstances. I think, you know, it would be possible if we just simply, um, instead of having infrastructure week over and over again as as uh, an attempted distraction, um, if we actually paid attention to what's going on with infrastructure needs, um, that that certainly the problem would be mitigated and it would buy us some time to try to um, come up with with better long term solutions, I also think you know one of the people that that I talked to for the story, Justin Moaning, who's the the mayor of Norfolk. I think that he is exactly right in in recognizing that often a moment of destruction and crisis is the moment where you can since there's going to have to be money invested anyway, since there's going to be rebuilding anyway, it's a moment where you have the opportunity to rethink things in in big ways. And so I'm also persuaded by his argument that this may be a moment, and I think it's worth noting, he's a Republican mayor um, of a sort of a mid-sized Nebraska town. Um, But what he's saying is, you know, if if the roadways are already torn up and need to be replaced, Let's lay high-speed cable um, and and get so these these communities finally fully online um, and and as part of the rebuilding project. And if if there are um, other sorts of things, you know, places where the power lines have been have been destroyed, let's make it so that the, those power lines can uh, carry power from uh, from wind turbines and and find ways to make these communities greener and and contributors to the solution um, while we're in the midst of, of this rebuilding anyway. And you point out that he now bluntly insists on applying conservative market economics to issues such as climate change. Can this be taken to a larger scale and possibly adapted? Can this be part of the Green New Deal, despite it being from a conservative economic point of view? Well, I think in, in some of these states, this may be the best hope for this, uh, this conversation to move forward. And I mean, one of the things that struck me the most was him saying, you know, when, when I talk about what's conservative, um, that, that means, you know, being fiscally responsible and, you know, not being wasteful. And he said, you know, in a state like Nebraska, where we have these tremendous wind resources, why are we wasting those wind resources and not turning that into power? And instead, we're bringing in uh, coal from Wyoming to feed our coal-burning plants. 
and this is a this is a kind of a prime time to have these conversations because a number of our coal plants are also old and in need of either replacement or updating and he's saying rather than investing money in in repairing old infrastructure that is also wasteful of of a of a resource that we have right here in Nebraska why don't we take this opportunity use the the assistance that we're getting in emergency funds from from the feds build the infrastructure that we need to to make the most of what we have right here and you know if if the the way to appeal to people is to say these wind turbines will will bring your energy costs down maybe that's Maybe that's okay. I mean, I think we we ultimately have to have the conversations about um, the motivations for doing things and finding some collective sense of doing things uh, in the right way because it's it's an existential necessity. But I think for getting started and getting some people in in states like Nebraska over the hump, I think it's okay to say this is. This is more economically viable. It's it's something that um, is good for job creation within the state, and there's there's no reason for us to spite ourselves in order to continue to hew to this narrative that that climate change is a hoax. So why hasn't that worked yet? Because you write in making these changes part of the flood relief conversation, Mayor Moaning harkens back to a conference that he attended last year where Tom Vilsack, the former Iowa governor and secretary of agriculture under President Obama, outlined the challenges in talking to farmers about climate change. Vilsack said that when the U.S. Department of Agriculture offered materials helping farmers prepare for global warming, only 20 percent requested information. When the same materials were offered as guidance on preparing for weather variability, the response jumped to 80%. So are farmers both in denial about global warming and at the same time simultaneously very, very concerned about the increase in extreme weather? Yes. In a, in a word, yes. That, I mean, no one sees the, the effects of, of more extreme weather um, up close than farmers do. And, you know, what what Moaning was telling me reminded me immediately of of a conversation that I had some years ago with Don Wilhite, who was a, a climatologist and started the the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska. He was was the the lead scientist on the the climate report that was prepared at the state level in Nebraska, and what he told me was that when when farmers were brought in. And the the question was put to them directly, do you see the effects of climate change on your farm? The answer was always no, because they understood that that the the political party that they belong to, that the that the culture and the community that they belong to rejects climate change. But if you ask those same farmers, what do you see with drought cycles? They would say they're getting shorter. What do you see with weather extremes? They're getting larger, um, and and so on. You know, what do you see with 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 groundwater resources? They're growing more scarce. All of the indications of climate change were things that farmers were seeing firsthand. But if you ask them to describe it as climate change, they would balk at that. And obviously, what that means is that that we need to find a way collectively to have different kinds of conversations about this. And if that means something as simple as what Vilsack did, where you repackage climate change as extreme weather and people start paying attention and participating, I think, as I say, again, for like for an entry level, I think that, that, is, that that's effective and that there's no reason that, that we should, um, should not be willing to, to do that because – Ultimately, what this is going to take is collective effort. And if, if we have to, to go out and meet some people where they are in order to get them involved, I, I think that that's, that that's not only okay, but really going to be necessary. Do both Republican climate change denial and Democrats' inability to convince rural voters of the important role extreme weather plays in their futures, do both those things threaten the U.S. food supply or the politics of both the Republicans and the Democrats? A threat to our food supply and thus our national security. Well, I think 
you know, right now, what what we've done is essentially place the the, the majority of our ag economy um, in a position where it is it is entirely dependent on two crops that are rotated, and that's corn and soybeans, and then a, a vast quantity of them are exported to China and exported to Mexico, and if you are in a position where you've made a, a large swath of your of your economy dependent on this a state like Nebraska is forty percent of its economy is dependent on the ag sector if 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 the ag sector collapses, if it takes a significant hit as it seems poised to do, it will have a tremendous ripple effect. Um, you already see it in in rural communities where you say, well, you know there there are fewer and fewer farmers. Um, so the impact is is mitigated, but the reality is that if the farmer is having a, a down year and and now having had a stretch of down years, um, they're not buying farm equipment, they're not spending money in town, um, they're not buying trucks, they're not buying houses, and all of that affects the larger economy. And when you're talking about small rural communities and those economies, having the people in the surrounding areas not have the, the, the money that they need to spend into the economy to keep it going means that those communities are faltering fast. And yes, I think that that there is a kind of indifference out of the Republicans right now because they look at, at places, I mean, rural Nebraska there were there were many places that that went 80% for Trump and so you can have widespread defections and still expect to carry the majority in those areas which means that they essentially get written off by republicans but the same is true of, of the democrats the democrats look at those areas and say this is an unwinnable um place politically and so we're not going to invest any time. We're not going to invest any uh, policy efforts into these areas. What I think is exciting about something like the Green New Deal is that we're seeing a, a, a new generation of politicians coming into national politics who recognize that, especially when we're talking about climate issues, but also when we're talking about global food issues, I mean, we can't talk about these things the way that we talk about elections in terms of precincts and in terms of, you know, these voting blocks, whether we like it or not, we're all in this together and we're all going to have to find solutions that involve everyone. And if, if we decide that we're not going to bring the, the ag community along, we're not going to reach our, our uh, objectives for, for climate change mitigation. And obviously the impact of that is disastrous. You write, what resources are the Democratic National Committee likely to commit to Nebraska where the or when the political pendulum seems never to swing, perhaps in a state consigned to virtual one-party rule? The best hope for tackling climate change emerges from forward-looking Republicans like Mary Moaning. Or perhaps there's a moment of epochal change simmering unseen. Unseen. What hopes do you have for some unseen uprising to take place? Well, I think the most interesting thing um, that's come out recently is a is a study that is underway by a pair of um, political science professors at Iowa State University. They've been looking at the, um, the the changes in voting patterns between the 2016 and the 2018 elections. Usually, a two-year span is not enough to see any political shift at all. Um, but they actually saw some radical shifts in um, in short-term voting behavior, and where they saw it was um, was mostly in counties that are reliant on the production of soybeans. That, in essence, the people who in 2016 thought, let's roll the dice and we'll go vote for Trump. He says that he's going to change trade deals and make them more advantageous for us, that he's going to be uh, friendly to farmers, that by two years later, they had shifted and were voting for Democrats or not voting at all. 
one of the two. The the shift in those counties was was gigantic. There were places where they measured that there were 50-point shifts in some of those soybean-producing counties. What that tells me is that as these pressures really hit home, as these no longer become political issues that are, are ideological or are cultural, but become questions of economic survival, that, that people will be persuaded to go with, with whoever is there to offer them a lifeline. It may be that, that the, the best opportunity is, is for Republicans, um, moderate Republicans, because people will feel less like they are um, betraying their, their community or, or their, their past votes. But I think it may also be a case uh, of where people will vote for a candidate or, or a slate of candidates who show up and say, look, the old political divides don't matter. You need to vote for the people who are here interested in, in trying to help you out and making the, the assistance that you get, get fit into a, a bigger picture that helps the whole country. We have been speaking with writer Ted Genoways, who posted the New Republic article, River of No Return, How Austerity and Climate Change Put Northeastern Nebraska Under Water. Ted was on our show a couple of times in the past, including when he was on in 2015 to discuss his book, The Chain, Farm, Factory, and the Fate of Our Food. You can go to thisishell.com and just search on Ted's name, Ted Genoways, and you can find all of our interviews with him. Find out more about Ted at tedgenoways.com. That's G-E-N-O-W-A-Y-S. One last question for you, Ted, and as always, it's the question from hell, the question we hate to ask, you might hate to answer, our audience is going to hate your response. So you you quote Jane Klebe, the chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party, and she says rural communities are often forgotten and the recent flooding shows this fact up close and then noting that the entire Democratic field is feverishly campaigning in Iowa, but not one Democratic candidate came to Nebraska, not so far from Iowa, to serve right. sur- to survey the flood damage. So are Democrats again shooting themselves in the foot in middle rural America? Well, I, I can quote my dad here. My dad is, is uh, <laughs> f- fond of saying, he's a, a born and raised in Nebraska, he's fond of saying that when it comes to politics, Nebraskans uh, are, are here to remind you that you don't only have one foot to shoot yourself in. So <laughs> the the... The Democrats, um, I think, are often the same way, that, that, um, that you say, well, a state like Nebraska is unwinnable, but if you don't commit resources, if you don't, if you don't spend any time in a place like this, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what I see right now is how strongly some of the the policies presented by Elizabeth Warren in particular seem to be resonating in Iowa and i think that that that's the case not only because the candidates are there and and speaking directly to people but in Warren's case it seems to be true because she showed up with specifics that she didn't just say we're going to take care of our farmers we're going to make sure that your crops are are purchased around the world. She had specific plans for it, and a lot of those plans were not just saying, um, "Here's some of the things that we're going to do to tinker with the system," but saying, "We need to remake the system so that it's no longer um, really got got farmers under the thumb of big corporations. We're going to try to make this something where you have more freedom." where you have more say-so, um, and where you're able to flourish based on your hard work and, and your knowledge. And, of course, that resonates with people. But the thing is that if you're going to have a message like that that, that really goes far, you've got to take it to people. And it's, it's got to be more than just prep for the Iowa caucuses. It's, it's got to be a, a region-wide strategy. And it'll take some time. But the alternative is to just always have these states uh, voting for Republicans and 
and forming a block that that makes the, the the path to national victory difficult for the Democrats. Ted, always a pleasure to hear your voice. Everybody should go to check out all of Ted's work at tedgenoways.com. I cannot stress how great the book was, The Chain, when we discussed it here on our show. Thanks so much again for being back on our show, Ted. Thank you, Chuck. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com.